Thanks for joining me again for the Real Rescue Podcast, powered by Vertical Helicast. Another shout out to our sponsor for this episode. That's Axness. Their mission, wireless intercoms. Get in touch with them today at axness.com. And now it's part two. Let's finish a story with United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 699, Mr. Rob Simpson. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is the Real Rescue Podcast. We're going to bring you down into the stand team. Um, was it that that's where you ended up because you had two years left in your uh, enlistment or in your time before you're going to retire. And this is where your wife said, you got to talk to somebody. It's time for you to unload and, and stuff. And, and this is another reason, like I said, why I brought you here. So is that, is that right? So you're down in the stand team. Yep. Yeah, so I went down the stand team, which was awesome too. Like that was a great time period. Um, I had great leadership down there. Uh, it was just to to end my career at the stand team in the Coast Guard was just amazing. But uh, and especially during that time period where we were like pushing new policy and growing the AHARS program, it was all very positive. So um, it was interesting that like that's the point where uh, things kind of slipped away um, headspace wise for me because. I, you know, I worked with the best people, um, and was doing an incredible, super fun job, <clears throat> but, uh, I, I don't know, like something about maybe not staying on duty and compartmentalizing those, those moments in my career. Like it just crept up on me, man. And, and my, my cup filled up and thankfully, you know, my wife is, is a pretty, uh, no BS kind of person. And, and eventually got to the point where she's like, yo, like we need to address this. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that, yeah. man. Uh, good for her. Good, seriously, good for her. Because I, I think my wife right now would would absolutely do that. You know what? Come to think of it, she does it to me quite often. Like, hey, knock <laughs> that shit off. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, babe. I don't mean to. I'm being an asshole. My bad. I'm sorry. But dude, it's important. Right, well, yeah, it's good to have someone on your team that that will call you out like that. You know? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, like I said, one of the greatest parts about this is you wrote an article for uh, Mountain Technical Institute. And the headline is, or the title of it is speaking to a flight doc about my sleeping and stress struggles got me grounded, but it was worth it. Um, if you don't mind what I'd like to do, I'd like to read quite a bit of this and then kind of backstory and, and get the, the finer details. Is that cool? Sure. Yeah. Whatever your process is, man, I'm on board. Right on. Let's go. Flight doc to me. We're going to have to ground you as a career aviator. Those are words you never want to hear. At least I never wanted to hear them. Over the course of a long career, there were a few down chits for short-term tweaks here and there. This time was different. It started with nightmares. I'd wake up in the middle of the night drenched in sweat, not sure if I was home or at work. The dreams were distorted and subconscious mix of different SAR cases and survivors or deceased. After a few years of constant sleep issues, things evolved a little more. I started avoiding social interactions, going to the grocery store, pegged my adrenaline. I'd sweat through my t-shirt sitting in the parking lot, psyching myself up to walk into the store to grab a few odds and ends that my wife asked me to pick up on the way home from the air station. Even routine events like my kids' sports or small group Bible studies became stress-inducing obstacles. On a rare occasion that I was home for the weekend, I'd spend my daughter's Sunday morning soccer games looking over my shoulder on high alert for no discerning reason. I drove my wife nuts. If we ended up at the neighbor's house for dinner, I'd spend most of the evening outside, often alone. I was a hair trigger. My adrenaline was stuck in overdrive. I later learned the term hypervigilance. One Sunday morning, as we were getting ready for church, one of my girls dropped the pan in the kitchen. I snapped. I jumped out of my seat, full speed ahead. I looked like I was responding to a SAR case. I looked like a linebacker in the fourth quarter of the playoff game, distinctly out of place in our quaint kitchen. Within the span of seconds, I went from calm, calmly sipping a cup of coffee in our farmhouse table to level 10. If you've ever been there, you know what I mean. Thankfully, I didn't yell or scream at my daughter. 
who had done nothing wrong. My wife, however, recognized the look on my face and sat me down for a little chat. It was time to talk to the flight doc. Truth be told, I made this promise a few years in a row. On previous mornings before annual flight physical appointments, as I poured my coffee, my wife would ask me, are you going to come clean? I would say, yeah, sure. I'll feel it out. As nightmares, sleep issues, and anxiety got more and more intrusive, I'd tell my wife it was high time to bring it up to the doc. But there was one thing. Work was my life. Being a helicopter rescue swimmer in the Coast Guard wasn't just some job I clocked in at. I lived and breathed it. It was, it was all I ever wanted to do, and being part of the community was everything. When it came to medical, honest conversations about headspace issues were known as a career death sentence. I fell into the trap of sowing my self-worth and identity into my career, which is dangerous ground. But like any well-laid trap, you don't know you're in it until it's too late. Dr. Jordan Peterson says something to the effect of, telling the truth will set you on the adventure of your life. I can honestly say that talking to my flight doc about my mental health challenges wholesale changed the trajectory of my life. I was in such a rough spot that I was willing to put my 18-year career in a jeopardized position. I walked into medical that morning, ready to metaphorically hand over my wings for good. I held my hat in shame. My posture was defeated. I felt guilty. I felt selfish. I felt like I was putting myself before my team. I felt like I thought I was going to be a pariah, an outsider to the community that I loved like family. But here's the thing. None of that happened. After leveling with him, the 06 flight doc leaned back in his chair and took a silent beat to meet my gaze. He was cool, calm, and collected. After I told him what was going on, he looked at me straight in the eye and said, You've given the Coast Guard so much for so long, now it's our turn to look after you. Rob, that that is that right there is exactly what a lot of us talk about and what we're all scared of. You've worked so hard in your career to get to the point where you're at that you're scared to go in and be like, I can't handle it. You know, that that the famous line in the movie of Top Gun, I've lost my edge. And uh like we don't want to do that. So I, I totally understand where you're coming from that and hats off for you for doing that, but you got grounded and that, that was like a, that's a big deal. So what I'm, what I'd like to know is bring us to that point. Cause I'm going to read further in the article, uh, but bring us to that point. What was it that finally made you go in there and, and the relief of the command? Yeah. So it was a conglomeration of a couple things. And um, like, like I, I put in the article, I wasn't sleeping well. I was having these like horrible nightmares uh, where I'd wake up, I'd be drenched in sweat and, you know, just these horrible dreams that were like a mishmash of different star cases over the years. Um, and that's, that was more towards the end. The nightmares were like kind of the late, later symptoms. Um and for me at, at that point in my life, like I was great. I was like a performer at work, quote unquote. You can ask my supervisors for the truth. I don't know, but <laughs> for the purposes of this interview, like I was functioning well at work, you know, as far and, as I uh, know, you're a friggin' rock star, right? Rob? I got you, man. <laughs> right. Just don't do any background checking on that at all. Um, and you can, we can just we'll, we'll work under the assumption that I was a performer and a rock star. Look at my, um, I just did my own fact check. Check is good. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, you know, like flying never bothered me, the doing the work that, that was it. That's I lived and breathed that stuff. And, and, uh, I just wanted to be at work doing work things. Um, and when I was home, there was a disconnect. Like I couldn't relax. I, you know, like I couldn't go in a grocery store without sweating through a t-shirt. I couldn't talk to people, uh, going to social events was just a nightmare. Like trying to, uh, I couldn't, I, I couldn't be in enclosed spaces with people. I, you know, even in the middle of the winter time, I'd go and excuse myself and stand outside. There were times where I would just go stand in the rain because I didn't want to go talk to people at, at these like very, and to give backstory towards the end of this, we lived in this like beautiful, sweet Mississippi rural town. And we had a very welcoming community and my wife integrated with them and they were the nicest people and they still are. We're still connected with them, even though we moved away, but I just couldn't, 
I couldn't connect. And I spent a lot of time isolated and alone. And the only people that I could talk to were work people, um, you know, the swimmers and, and the people on the, in trade up at, at, at work, you know, like that was it. I, I couldn't, there's just like a weird disconnect for me. And, uh, we'd go to soccer games and I'd be peeking over my shoulder and like, like this things that in retrospect don't really have a rational explanation, but I was pegged all the time. I'm like, my adrenaline was pegged. And, uh, so I was tired and, um, my performance in the gym has never been great. Like, let's be honest about that. Like I'm not a superstar, but like I started to suffer a little bit, you know, like I was just like still passing the, the PT, you know, the PTAs and stuff, but like, just wasn't the amount of time I was putting into it. I should have been getting stronger and better and faster and all that, but I wasn't, I was dragging. Um, so that was a key indicator as well. And, and then eventually, you know, like those intrusive thoughts, like those super negative, dark thoughts, like, like would just like seep into my brain. And, uh, it was just like, I didn't get a break, um, and things got gnarly. And that was like, that was the, the kind of the, the impetus for change was when, you know, I, those of you know me, I'm pretty laid back and mellow, um, even when things are kind of getting heavy and I have patience for days, especially with my girls. And when that thing was, was where my youngest dropped a pan and I like went ready to, you know, bust through a wall, like just from zero to like psycho in about, you know, 0.3 seconds. Um, thankfully, like it was like a non-issue. Like she doesn't know that it happened. I didn't like yell and scream, thankfully. But like my wife realized it because it was so out of character for me to be like reacting that way. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, it's so awesome. You know, my wife, uh, was, was comfortable enough in our relationship to be like, yo, you need to like do something, man. Like, like, at, and then we had the conversation and that's kind of the heavy thing too, is like for us in our career, you have to consider that if you go and talk to a flight surgeon, you'll never fly again, you know? And, right. and it, it was at the point where I was okay with that. You know, being a husband and a father is more important to me then, uh, you know, it was worth the risk, you know? So, and that, that's what, that was kind of what the impetus for change was. It's like, um, I wanted to be a, a functioning human outside of work, you know? And I was 18 years yeah. into my career at that time. So I was, I was staring down the barrel of having a forced, uh, period of not being a rescue swimmer, you know, like I, it was coming yeah. to an end, you know? So I was like, well, what's that look like? I don't even know. Um, so yeah, I went and, uh, yeah, I talked to the flight surgeon during an, an annual, well, it wasn't that easy. So I was, I was a coward about it, you know, like, yeah, never... okay, here it is. Here it is. Yeah. I like it. I like it. <laughs> the yeah, honesty. Yeah. This is what I'm looking for. Come on, Rob. Yeah, man. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's the truth, man. Like, you know, the surveys they put out, like, I was just like, I'm going to be honest on the survey. And so before you go in that they send you this, like, very generic survey, like how much do you drink? At that time, I, I'd stopped drinking uh, a couple years before. So, um, but how do you sleep? You know, what's your stress level? Do you brush your teeth? You know, I was like, no, I don't brush my teeth all the time. <laughs> so that was the red flag. They're like, bro, you don't brush your teeth. Like bad breath, man. Yeah. Gingivitis. <laughs> totally, that's ter- dude. That's terrible. No. Man. I'm sorry. I mean, we just downplayed it. Like, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you smell my bad breath? Is that? Uh, no, it, 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 through the screen. Bad. Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> no. So I was honest and, and like the, the flight surgeon came in and he had like the, the, you know, I guess the corpsman like prints it out before the flight surgeon. He walks in for a PHA and he's like, hmm, so you're in the red on a lot of these categories, man. Like if I go off the numbers here, like you're severely depressed and um, like your anxiety level, like we, we have to talk about this. So I, I didn't bring it up from the get-go I, I brought it up happenstance by being honest on my my <laughs> the pha survey they put out so that that invited the the conversation and uh when uh when he was like okay cool well we're gonna have to ground you and blah blah, blah. that's when i was like okay cool let me tell you exactly i'll tell you exactly what's going on it's like he had to take it away from me and for me to like let that settle for a second to to be like okay cool well if i'm grounded i'm gonna be honest with you anyway so and that's when nice. I told him about the nightmares and the, the anxiety and, you know, all that stuff. So, 
All right, I'm I'm gonna dive in a little deeper with this uh, because there there are guys out there that were that are doing this right now that have that may be feeling the same way. I, I know at one point in my career I felt like that, um, and I love the fact you're you're sharing this now. This is, this is greatly appreciated. So, one is do you know where it started and do you know why it it happened the way it happened to get you to that point? Because you're talking like let's think about this for a minute. So you're at 18 years in the Coast Guard. Four years was a bosun's mate. Then you had school and you had to get qualified. So let's take five years out of the mix, right? So now you're you're like 13 years of rescue swimmer, standing duty, and I'll even drop it down to maybe, let's see, uh, 10? 10 years of standing duty flying because stand team, once you got down there, you said you had about four or five years at stand team, right? Yeah. So yeah, five give years. or take. So let's, let's go 11 years. It's shot in the dark. But from the time you were qualified, first rescue – to that point yeah uh that's a that's a very insightful question um and the only reason i i have an answer that that might be helpful is is, is that i had a really good counselor that helped me and, and we talked about that kind of stuff um and i in my career in atlantic city i did have a case that the outcome ended up being fairly negative you know like and it was a herculean effort you know, everybody did the right thing. We tried our best, but at the end of the day, the, you know, we hoisted this fisherman who was in respiratory distress and he ended up expiring, but he expired a couple of days later in the hospital. Um, and there was a large amount of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's not an investigation, but there was like criticism, like, Hey, if there had been a paramedic, like from, from the media outlets, it was like, Hey, this guy, Oh, blah, blah, blah. And they heard about it. it like the local the news. Yeah. So I guess like oh. from what I heard, like the, the family of the deceased who was obviously just dis distraught, you know, over this, um, started asking questions and, and, and kind of used the media as a weapon against the coast guard against us. I, I tried to stay away from it. So I don't, I don't have like the full story, but what I got was, you didn't do a good enough job. You probably should have saved this guy. <laughs> so when you're like a young swimmer, um, who's doing everything they can, and we had a very limited skill set. you know, EMTB is, is kind of like a very entry level. Um, I don't know. It, it's, yeah. there's a skill set that maybe could have helped this guy. And that's what, what kept, um, uh, that, that, that bugged me, right? Like maybe if I had had a higher level of care or maybe if I made a different decision or something. So anyway, um, I'm dealing with this as a 24 year old kid with, with no, again, I think I mentioned like my emotional intelligence is not very high. So, um, <laughs> it was just like, it just, it became destructive. Right. So I'd, I'd have SAR cases and instead of being like, Hey, that was a good job. I would stay up for days thinking about what I could have done better. Um, even on successful outcomes or cases where people are like, man, that was awesome. That was gnarly. You did a good job, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, no, man, no, I should have done this. I should have done that. Like if I, if I, if I really had my head in the game, I probably would have done this or that. Um, and I think this is something too, that if you did your background checking, like people would, would attest to the fact that like, I never celebrated anything, man. Like if it had to do with me, if it had to do with you, I would celebrate all day long. And I think that's awesome. And I'd be very complimentary and, but like when it was me, it was like, bro, there's like 15 things I could have done better on that SAR case. Um, and that was my whole career, you know, those 13 years or whatever, being a swimmer, like every time we went back to the barn after a case, you know, clean the plane, turn everything around, I wouldn't sleep for three days. I'd be like writing things down that I should look up, like just, just what can I do better next time? Wow. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's a very, yeah. very healthy way to approach uh, search and rescue, you know? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's so good. <laughs> I think that kind of, that's like what set me up for what happened, you know, at year 18, uh, was just, I, I, I think my cup just filled up at that point. And, and the other thing is too, is like, I wasn't standing duty in the traditional sense of the stand team. Like our job is, uh, training for the most part. And we still fly and, and get after it, but like, I'm not, I'm not serving the duty schedule at that point. Like, so I feel like that file cabinet opened up, um, with all the cases that I hadn't thought about or all the, the things that I hadn't resolved <clears throat> at that point in my life, it, it just all came out and it came out weird and distorted. And, um, 
and because I had put a negative spin on even the good stories, because, um, you know, again, like I was trying to poke holes in my own successes because yeah. I wanted to get better, you know, which is kind of a counterintuitive approach, but, uh, yeah. So nothing, it was all kind of like, I felt like I was trying to plug holes on a dam that was just collapsing around me. Wow. Wow, Rob. Dang. All right. I'm going to bring up another question here. So now you get into, you get into the spot now. The flight surgeon has now told you, all right, Rob, we're going to have to ground you. Um, it goes on in the article and I'm not going to read it verbatim yet, but uh, you go back to the shop, you go back to the command. And I, I like, I can feel this right now when you have to walk in there and be the, a bit of a bearer of bad news and be like, guys, I can't help you at all. I can't fly. I can't do this. And now you, now you've, it's almost like, I, I don't even, I don't know if anybody else could relate to this. Uh, but if you play sports, it's like getting hurt. Like, and all of a sudden now you can't help your team at all. You're on the sideline and you want to be in the game. You want to be there, but you can't be like, you're not allowed to be. So yeah. what I'd like you to do is can you walk us through a little bit of that and then the reaction from the command and the shop? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank, thanks for, for bringing that up. Cause I think that's a huge part of the story that I, if any part gets out and people start talking about, like, this is the key, man. Um, and for, for me personally, like it was hard, hard to take a knee. Um, but look, the flight surgeon handled it like a professional. He was like super respectful. There was no drama. It was like, hey, we could take a beat, take a knee, and and we're gonna get you the help you need. Like no big deal, right? Like I don't know if you're gonna fly again. He was very very honest about it. like I don't know what's gonna look like for you, but he did the right thing, man. You don't need to be out there doing this right now. And uh, like it was hard to accept, but the way he handled it was so professional um, that it was hard. Like I just like okay, all right, that's the first step. That was hard, but he his forward thinking and his accepting of the moment and how he handled it, like set the stage for how the rest of this whole thing played out. So like my story is really just like a love letter to how the command and the medical department and my teammates handled this whole thing, man. Like uh, it was, it was incredible. So like they send me down and to the air force facility and they're kind of like coast guard, like what the heck are you doing here? But they were all very cool with me. <laughs> and uh, I didn't like even know we had a coast guard. What the heck is a coast yeah, guard? Totally. <laughs> Dude, and I did the typical swimmer thing and I, I wore my PT gear, you know, I'm like short shorts and PT gear and rolled in there like, Oh, Hey, you know, and they're all in their, their uniforms. And I'm like, I don't know at this point, like oh, I'm grounded. Man. I might be getting kicked out. So I don't need to like put a uniform on, you know? So, but they were so cool. Um, and I don't, I don't know if I mentioned it in the article or not. I can't remember, but like the, the person that helped me who ended up being my counselor, was like the head of the department down there. And she was like, look, I don't take on, patients right now, but I will take you on personally. Like we, we will help you. And the way that she handled it was, yeah, like I see this stuff all the time. No big deal. All you, all you're showing are like symptoms to a problem. Like if, if you, and I think she might've been the one that brought up the, the metaphor of like, if you blew out your knee, like you would have symptoms. And this is the same kind of thing. Like you're having symptoms to an issue and we will just get to the bottom and figure it out. And I've seen people return to flight duty and it might be your case too, but you know, that's a long way down the road. So don't get your hopes up. It's like, no, I don't even care at this point. Just hearing that it set me at ease. Like, cause the, the things they see in the air force, they're probably very similar. If not, you know, like just some it's, yeah. it's comparable. It's congruent. So to hear her say that was like, yo, I'm like a, you're like one of 50 dudes I talk to every day, like no big deal. And that was helpful to me. Cause like, I think that's part of the nature of, of like what that headspace does. It makes you feel isolated. It makes you feel like you're alone. It makes you feel like you're the only person that's ever felt this way. And like, lo and behold, it's not true. Like it, it is, that's why there's such this push for like people understanding mental health and, and like, you're not alone. Like those are symptoms. Just like if you blew out your knee or somebody poked you in the eye, you know, like, you're like, Oh yeah, yeah. Like that's, that's, that's a reaction, a normal reaction to like what kind of things that, that we're exposed to. And, um, and then, so on the, on the other hand, like, dude, so driving home from the, the air force facility, I get a call from a pilot who I've been stationed with in, um, Atlantic city. And he was actually the acting XO of the air station at ATC that day. And I'm so lucky that he was in that position. So he calls me up and says, Hey, can you come by the command building? 
And I was like, you know, yes, sir. Yeah. So I, at this point I did put a uniform on. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Didn't roll up into acting exos, <laughs> friggin' PT gear. Yes, sir. How can yeah, I help you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. To all you swimmers out there, I did put a uniform on to go square the exos uh, office. So, uh, smart man. Huh? Um, yeah. If you take nothing else out of this, this message, like mental health or regardless, put a uniform on when you go to the exos office. Uh, um, so you know, and, and like I square his office and, and he's just like, and we had a pretty gnarly case in Traverse city together and we had a rapport. He's a great pilot. And uh, he was actually the head of trade up before he took over the, you know, DXO position. So really good guy. Um, and, and he knew me thankfully. And he was like, yo, basically we got you. The command has your back. And we were supposed to go to a I was supposed to get a horse um, that next week and instruct. And I asked him, like, what, what do you guys want me to do? And he's like, you proceed how you need to proceed. Like, the command backs you 100%. We just want you to, to get the help you need, and you let us know what you need in, in this journey, basically. And I was, like, ugh, like so relieved. It was just like, okay, well, I just want to be part of the team. I want to I want to still contribute. I don't want to be broken. Like, I know I can't fly, but there's if there's anything I can do to still be an active part of the team. And he's like, yeah. No problem. Uh, so the XO just broke it down for me and said, we've got your back. We, we just want to do what's right for you and, and get you to where you, you know, they, they legitimately supported me. And you think that they say that stuff, like you hear these commands, like, Hey, we support you. We support you. We support you. If you, if you're out drinking, call the chief's mess and we'll take you home. No questions asked. And you're like, dude, uh-huh. no, but I'll tell you what my command, they backed me up 100%, um, from the, the skipper all the way down. Um, which is incredible to think about a giant organization would, would have that kind of foresight and, and progressive thinking to say, Hey, this guy's having a rough go. We're going to support him how we can. And that's it. Like they, they, that was their only expectation was to support me. Um, so it's just amazing. And, and I say that with caution because I know that there are commands out there that don't have that kind of foresight and and not everyone is on on that level not everyone is that kind of leader so um if there's anyone out there who you know is on on the edge like i'm not telling you just run to your flight surgeon and stuff like there's there's stuff to to take into consideration on the individual level but like my command at that time they were the best you know my medical department at that time they were very forward thinking and very supportive and then that extends to my shop my leadership my senior chief my chief my teammates like they were all like yeah man like we love you dude and we know that something's been bugging you for a while we just didn't know how to talk to you about it you know <laughs> it took your wife oh god bless her <laughs> yeah 100 percent, man and, and that's like what you think about like like what what these stories could potentially turn into you know like there's so many opportunities for it to have gone another direction. You know, uh, my wife doesn't say anything. I never get help. Who knows where that goes, you know, or right. I tell the flight surgeon and he's a policy guy, policy, policy, policy. And they just like end my career and med board me on the spot. That wasn't the case. Um, or the command is like, Hey, you're, you're not holding up your end of the bargain. Like you're no good to us. We're going to send you, you're going to go, you know, work in the fuel farm or something, you know, like, which is all within their right to do. Like they don't, yeah. it's, it's kind of like, a, um, but that, that was not my experience. My experience was like support from everybody. And it was very humbling. And for somebody in my position, you realize that there's people that do care about you that you never thought would care. And you realize that the system, it, it, it's designed to like get you back in the game if, if you, if you put the effort into it, you know? So it was 10 months of like really, really hard work and, and like talking about things that were very uncomfortable and sweating through more t-shirts, um, you know, with, with the counselor and, and they let me travel and, and which was amazing too. Cause I got to connect with guys on the road, you know, going to swimmer shop and they'd be like, Hey Rob, why aren't you flying? And I was honest. I'd tell them like, yeah, man, like I had some headspace issues going on. My command's super supportive and they're letting me stay on the road and, and help out with, things that aren't in the flying capacities, you know, so I could still give PT tests and, and uh, like talk about policies and things like that and, and support, support the mission, but I just wasn't flying. So, wow. Yeah. That's all, like mad props to your whole command. I, I, I got to start with you really like good on you for, for bringing it up to make that happen. That's, that's a, that's a huge, huge step. So, um, we're gonna divert real quick to thank our sponsor, Axness. Because when lives are at stake and conditions are challenging, 
clear communication is of the utmost importance. If you don't mind, I, I want to come back to the article real quick because uh, there's a couple things in here that you say that I, I really am super psyched about because it is that, I don't want to call it a Cinderella story, but it's that happy ending. It's the, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel type finish. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to, I'm going to finish it up on the back end. Is that cool? Yeah, man. Do your thing. All right. Back to Dr. Pearson's quote, being honest about my mental health, unlock a world, unlocked a world I didn't know existed. People really cared. My family supported me. The flight doc went out of his way to help me. My chain of command, all the way up to the skipper, backed me up and treated me with respect. Not like I was broken or partially mission capable. This was the key that unlocked everything. If I had a broken leg on a star case and was in crutches, they would have treated me the same way. Don't get me wrong. It was a long road. It was hard work spilling my guts every week. It was uncomfortable to talk about things that I didn't want to talk about. I continued to wet, sweat through t-shirts. I will share this. Not everyone got it. I'd, I'd love to say that it was all rainbows and hugs, but I wouldn't be telling the truth. There was an unexpected ripple effect as well. I was part of a team that traveled and trained at almost every aviation unit. I was on the road. I was honest about why I wasn't flying. I told my story to the other guys who asked. I didn't filter anything. I was grounded for headspace stuff. That's how I opened up. I interacted with other swimmers all the time across the country. I had a pretty expansive network of friends who were heavy hitters. There were, after a few chats offline, other guys who opened up and talked about their own experiences in a relieved that, hey, it's not just me tone. Down the line, a few guys decided to get help also. Fast forward 10 months. I had another follow-up to the flight doc. He'd asked me to come in once a month and check in. And he kept close comms with my Air Force counselor. It was clear that I had bought into the process. My sleep was better. My anxiety was more manageable. I was able to go out into the world with my girls and have a relatively good time. I was more productive at work. Even though I wasn't flying, I was able to find my game. At 10 months... I asked a flight doc when he thought I could get back in the helo. For those who may not know, there's a giant administrative hurdle that has to be carefully navigated in the military aviation world. One of the buzzwords is waiver. You need a waiver from some medical headquarters unit to fly again. And typically, they are stingy at best with flight waivers for mental health issues. Rightfully so. When it came time for me to learn my fate, there was a few factors in my favor. First, I knew I was retiring in the next two years. I was 100% sure that I was punching out at 20. Second, my symptoms improved significantly during my treatment time frame. The third factor was my chain of command. My chief and senior chief made some non-standard calls up the chain on my behalf, and for that, I will be forever grateful. Essentially, Instead of going through the whole waiver process, my flight doc took these factors into consideration and said, get some. I was granted a local waiver at the command level and was immediately able to resume flight duties. There was one stipulation. My flight doc asked me to come to him immediately if things started to regress. He put an immense amount of professional and personal trust in me and for all intents and purposes, staked his and the command's reputation on it. Read it this way. I was treated like a valued professional. In less than a year, I was fully fit for duty. So here's the big picture. For a long time, my life was small and it felt like I was getting smaller and exponentially darker. I was fortunate to have the people in my life who called me out and I was equally fortunate to have my ego in check enough to eventually listen. Once I took a hard, grim first step, everything changed. I finally saw the way forward. In retrospect, the idea that the rest of my life was going to be increasingly gloomy and dark until who knows when, that hopeless and endless grind seemed insurmountable. I couldn't see past it. Once I ripped the proverbial band-aid off and got some help, there was a new course of action. It was hard. It sucked. It was humbling. But in the end, 
It kept me in the game. Rob, this is an awesome, awesome article. And I hope that everybody out there that hears this can understand that it's not game ending. It's not game over. It's a broken piece. And, and it is unfortunate from time to time. And I'll back you up on this. Not every command is there. Not every command is going to have the same view on it. You had a command level waiver to get flying again, but it, it shouldn't end us. Just let me, let me take a knee for a minute. Let me get a break. I'm with you. And, and my hat's off to you for being able to do that and coming forward to telling everybody this. I, let me throw one more thing in and then, and then you're going to, you're going to take us through it. But when I, when you and I first talked about this, I asked about, um, you like, Hey, can you send me some awards so I can read some of this stuff and highlight you in your career? And you said you had a gnarly case up in, uh, up in Traverse city with, the, with the acting XO. And I love the response because so many of us are like this. You're like, Oh dude, it, it's in a box somewhere. I, I buried that away. I haven't seen that in who knows how long. And I'm like, right on that. That's cool. Okay. Well, I don't need it. I just like it. I like to highlight you guys in everything that you've done. And, but this, I love the fact that I can highlight this and what you've done to start a path that could potentially ground you for and be done done to then hear your back flying again to finish out your career. It's freaking badass, dude. Well done. Well, uh, those are very kind words and, uh, I appreciate you saying them, man. Um, but really it, it had nothing to do with me. I was just someone who needed a lot of help, you know, and, and uh, thankfully it's one of the things I, I love about you, man, is you use that hashtag. I love my wife. Well, I'm lucky to have, uh, yeah, dude. <laughs> totally do. Uh, I, I love my wife, you know, and she called me out she is, that's her personality, man. And, and that was very helpful. And then, you know, extended on, it was like out of my, out of my control, I just, I will say this, I did the work. Um, but the way that my command handled it, the way the medical department handled it, like, I think it's a case study, what happened with me and how a command and a medical department and a group of, of high performing team mates can work through this kind of a scenario where a guy's like, yo, man, my cup is full. I'm having these issues and they can just take a knee for a second and then get them back into the game. And, and that's, uh, I, I would say it's a little unprecedented in our community because it's at a certain point you'd see guys like, yeah, I hit my limit. And then, you know, they're med boarded, they're gone, they're, they're discarded. And, and yeah. the way that my command handled it, like I, at no point did I feel like they were going to discard me and I knew that they could, I knew they could at any minute, but they, they supported me and they treated me. Like I said there, that was like the key to this was like, they still treated me like I was part of the team. So even if there was any kind of chatter going on in the background at the command level, like what they're going to do with me or anything, like I never heard about it. And, you know, my senior chief, um, you know, BK, he was retiring, like that guy stood the line for me and he uh, just, you know, I'm so lucky to have people like that who are willing to be like, well, policy says this, but like Rob is my guy, you know, he's, he's yeah. the guy and it, and he's not some policy. He's going to come back from this. He's doing the work. He's, a, he's a performer, you know, quote unquote, you can ask him, you know, like down the line. If yeah. he was. But, uh, <laughs> it was just it, like, and dude, if I had a platform, like if, if people were like, Hey, we want to talk to Rob, like that would be my thing. It's like, not so much about me, but it's a case study in how, the the infrastructure of an organization organization like the Coast Guard can handle this, right? Like your medical department, how do they handle it? Well, every time I walked in there, they treated me like I was part of the team. They didn't treat me like I was a broken swimmer with headspace issues. Anytime I talked to the command, you know, they supported me 100%. They let me keep doing my job all except flying, which, you know, there's still a lot of things to do, you know, like if flying is the only thing that we do. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And right. there was no, no fallout, nothing, you know, like my marks didn't suffer, n none of that kind of stuff, you know, like, and, and that's amazing and very forward thinking, um, uh, for them and, and my chain of command. And then like all the guys I was stationed with at the time, like they just had my back, you know, at any point they could have been like, you know, talking trash about me or ostracized me or been like, Hey, I'm not, I'm not talking to you because, you're not pulling your weight on stand visits anymore. It, none of that. It was just like, how do we move forward? How do we find a way to, to incorporate you and work around this? And, and it ended up not being that big of a deal, you know, like for them. I mean, I'm sure that they had to pull some extra flights here and there. And, and, you know, for that, I apologize guys, but 
honestly, yeah. it, it was, it's just the nature of the beast, you know, and I'm just very humbled that I had the command and the people around me because like, like you said, I came back and I started yeah. flying again, you know, and, and that's, that was the other part that was really, really helpful is that they staked, they treated me like a professional, They're like, Hey man, like if you start having issues again, come to me immediately. And I was like, okay, I, I, and it got to the point where like I would, and I actually ended up um, going back during my, my, you know, when I, when I retired, you know, being honest with the guys, you know, but like for that year and a half in between, like it was like I didn't want to disappoint them. They'd stake so much on me. It meant so much that they had done what they did to trust me that I would never in a million years do anything to sacrifice that. You know? So it's just like yeah. it, if anything, it made me more more dialed in, you know. I uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. I like what you just brought up there. So I'm I'm gonna caveat. So the I just released an episode prior to this one. So the the episode literally just before you and I um or the episode this one is released was an asterisk episode with James Boomhauer and he's a clinical uh, psychologist or he's an intern currently. And um, we talk about a lot of PTSD. We talk a lot of systems, signs and symptoms and what you can do and uh, checklists throughout like family checklists, just run through and, and that how much help is out there and you can do. And one of the things we emphasize is you're, j- you're not, you're, you're not, you're not done. You're not burned out. You don't have to be. You can just, like you said, we can take a knee and take a take a minute. Now, to fall back to something else you just said, you were like, oh, you the guys might have had to take a couple extra flights. The, the guys might have had to stand duty a little bit more. And I, and I know a stand team, like, it's not duty so much as it is training flights. But one of the things that Boomer and I talked about is, well, I, I would do that for you, man. If, if, if I, if Rob needed help and I could help and I, and I'm, I got to take an extra flight cause, cause Rob needs to get his shit right. I'm in dude. I'm, I'm here to help. Now let me ask you, Rob, ready? If I needed some time, if I was having a rough time, would you take a flight for me or two or three? Absolutely. So if you and I would do it for each other, what, what makes anybody else think that we wouldn't do it for them? So I don't like, I hope everybody gets out of this. That It's okay to talk about it and it's okay to get back in the game. Take a knee, step on the sideline, take a break. Hopefully your command and, and for all the commands out there that are listening and, and everybody in that leadership role, man, you, you may have been there. You may not, but we're not, we're not out. We just need a break. So your turn. Yeah. I went <laughs> no, off on a tangent there. I'm sorry. It's very well said. <laughs> no, it's, that's very well said. Yeah. And, and I think that that, um, that's like, that's the whole magic of this, my specific article or whatever the story that I'm telling, it's not like me, like, Ooh, Rob went from like having headspace issues to fine again. The real story is how the command handled it, how medical handled it, how my teammates handled it, how the leadership looked out for me instead of dismissing me. And what, what did they end up with? They ended up with, a, uh, you know, almost 20 years of experience coming back into the game, you know, recharged, revitalized, better, better swimmer, better husband, better father. Everything was dialed in even tighter at the end of this 10 months. Um, and, and I think that that's important to know, you know, like I'm not one to say that I'm very good at anything. Um, but look, I did have a lot of experience and, and, um, to discard someone in a very small community, like that's a huge chunk of experience that could go go out the door and be left. It's a void at that point, even though like, again, like I'm not special. I'm not, I'm not like, like a superhero or anything like that, but there is a lot of experience and training and stuff and investment that the Coast Guard had made in me. And if they had sent me out the door, that would have gone with me, unfortunately. And they recognized that they recognized that, 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 that I was still a viable asset to the organization and they could get me back up and, and hitting on all cylinders again. So that's really the, the, the story I think is that you don't have to discard your people for taking a knee and it's almost unrealistic, you know, like now, look, I'm retired now. I got, I got no dog in the fight, but if you think about it, like the stuff that they ask us to do, it's a, it's a normal reaction sometimes for people to be like, yo, after 20 years of like, we don't have pre-deployment workups. We don't come back and take 30 days of leave or anything like that. Like, we show up and it's like always oncoming duty. You know, you know how it is, yeah. man. Like the duty yeah. schedule rules everything. And just cause you got eight guys in the shop, it doesn't mean you're not staying on duty once every four, you know, two, one and three, one and four for the, for an entire yeah. tour, you know? So for someone to hit their limit and be like, Oh, like I just need to take a knee and, and get my head right. 
and then they come back better and revitalize like man, right. there's gotta be there's gotta be a way forward you know yeah I, I'll, I'll caveat one more thing with that too is it and in your command back you up because they trusted you and believed you i would i would recommend that for everybody else is if i'm telling you i'm okay i'm not bullshitting you like i came clean or i'll speak for me alone so if i if i'm coming out and I, i've done it already like I've, I've come clean with a, a lot of my shit that i've had in the background i feel awesome i love it i and i I'm ready to come back. I am not going to bullshit you. If I feel weird or something doesn't sit right, man, I, I, I promise you, I will not go fly. I promise you, I will not be a hindrance on the crew. Have yeah. no illusions about it. Cause I want to come home safely too. So. Yeah. Well said, man. I, the only reason I say I is because I, I don't like, I really don't like putting like, oh, they are going to do this or somebody else is going to do that. I don't know how they're feeling. I don't know what they're going to do. I can tell you I won't. And I hope that everybody else is like that too. Like put, you know, put a little trust in your guy. If your guy's coming up and being honest with you about having issues, please give me an opportunity to come back. I guarantee yeah. it'll be okay. So. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the, uh, the dangerous things about writing policy that, that handles these things in a very generalized blanket way is because right. not everyone is the same, right? Like I understand that the need for policy, like I was stand team. I understand that like policy is very important and how it's written is very important. But when it comes to things like this, it's such a dynamic environment, right? Like the, the people are so different. They vary from person to person. And I would say that that is one of the, the key components of, of my specific scenario was that my command, my, my teammates, my leadership, they noticed that they know, they know me, they do what leaders do and they know their people. Yeah. So when I say, like you said, I need help, they know I'm not full of shit. <laughs> like I want, I want nothing more than to be okay, but like it's, it's at the point where it's not, you know, so I'm being honest with you. <laughs> So, and like, how do you, how do you bring somebody back from that? Well, you trust them and trust goes both ways, right? Like I'm trusting you with this like horrible story about how my life is unfolding because I show up for duty on time, you know, for, for 20 years. And then they reciprocated that they trusted me and it just, you know, how those things go. Like you know, even on the personal relationship level, if somebody extends that to you, you're like, yo, I love this person. And so that's how it was with the command is like, I love this command. I'd never do anything to put that in jeopardy, you know, at the end of this whole thing. So Right. It's just a, I just think I'll just keep saying it's like a, the way I look at this is just a case study and in, in, in how a command can take an active role and bring in somebody back, you know, like, and that's not yeah. what you hear. It's always the other way around. It's always like, oh, it's command, you know, they're, they're, they're railroading me. They're med boarding me. Like they, they're not yeah. treating me like, it's like you hear those stories and I just want to be, I, don't, I hate to say it, man, but I want to be the loud voice that says that that's, that was not my case, man. Like my command was awesome and there is a way to come back from this. We just need other people to like get on board with it, you know, like, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I might, even, you know what? I am going to throw this out there. Um, we as swimmers and I am going to very narrowly bring this down to the, the 300 dudes that are in the service right now, active duty, the thousand and 150 of us that are out there now, we are a, a, a different mindset. There, there is, there is something different about the way we think about how we go about stuff. So if we tell you we're going to come back and we're going to be okay, that's a fact. It's not, the, the, we're going to, if I tell you, I'm going to get back to the gym after I break my leg, I'm going back to the gym. I promise you. I, Oh, I tweaked my shoulder in this. Oh, it's going to heal. And I'm going to get back in the pool. I have no illusions. So if I tell you that I've, I've got a little something in my mind right now, that's not working. And I tell you, I'm going to be okay. And I'm coming back. There's a pretty damn good chance. I, I'm a fall through with that. I'm just going to throw that out there from all the swimmers I've ever been around. That is our mentality. So. Yeah, that's, it's interesting, man. Like I'd never thought of it that way, but you're so right, man. You see guys get like banged up real bad and they're like, this ain't nothing. I'm coming back, but you're right. A hundred percent can't. Why doesn't that extend to, to mental health issues as well? You know, like yeah. you're so right, you know, come back. Yeah, that's a good point, man. Yeah, get some. I have my moments. Just don't, don't <laughs> tell anyone, all right? <laughs> yeah. no, that's great, man. Rob, this has been an awesome conversation. I cannot thank you enough for coming on. I got one more question before I let you go. And that is, now that with everything you've gone through, so you had an amazing career, 20 plus years um, on the boat with some killer stories, great rescues, 
good, bad, whatever you don't think about it. I don't care. I think they were awesome. Thank you for sharing them. And then the, and then like having to deal with some struggles there, um, advice that you would pass on to everybody that's still doing the job. What, what would it be? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, so on my way out, uh, my retirement speech, I think that gratitude is the key for us in our position. And anytime that you have a chance to look at what's going on in front of you through the perspective of gratitude, you can't lose. Um, and this is as simple as, Hey, I'm a new third class and the maintenance Warren is, you know, up our ass about this or that, you know, it's like, Hey, I'm just going to get better at putting flow bags on the 65, right? Like if that's a thing anymore, like we had to do it and it sucked, but you know what? I learned how to do it. I learned how to, you know, so like finding gratitude because it's easy to go the other way and get super negative and be like, yeah, I'm a swimmer. I, I need to be doing this. Like, no, but that's not, that's not the way to look at it. I don't think, I think if you can be grateful for the things that you have and the people you're working with and the job that we get to do, you've said it a couple of times, like how awesome is this job? Like it is awesome. And so our, 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 our community is awesome. And it's like the best kept secret, you know, in the military is to be a swimmer and do this job and the people you're surrounded with. And I just, it took me a long time to get there. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. Like, I was not the third class who was grateful for the, the position that I, I had worked so hard to be in. Right. Like I found negative aspects and sometimes focused on them. And that's like poison, right? That's like drinking poison. And, and I think that when you use gratitude as a way to view your career and your relationships and these experiences that we all get to have together, like it just enriches the experience. It makes you better. Being grateful makes you better. Um, and finding, sometimes it's, it's a creative act, right? To, to find a way to be grateful in certain situations. But if you're able to do that, you'll emerge better and just ready to get after it, I think. And, and that's my big thing. And I tried to tell that to guys on my way out the door and, and, uh, I just don't know how well I articulated myself, but finding a way to be grateful will make you a dangerous person to deal with. I, I promise you, you know, like you just can't, you cannot be beaten if you're grateful for, for the situation you find yourself in. So that would, that would be my, my one, um, anecdote. Bro. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Rob, this has been an absolute pleasure. I am so thankful that you came on. I'm grateful that you came on. That's what I'm grateful for, <laughs> all right? Boom. Awesome. <laughs> awesome, oh. man. Bro, I hope to see you at D-Cert. I, I know that you've got uh, possibly some other plans going on. That's cool. If not, dude, I, I will find a way to meet you again. And if you're not drinking, I'll have a beer. I'll be here for coffee. How's that? Uh, that cool. sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. dude. I love it. Right on. Well, I'll see cool. you later. Again, thank you so much, my friend. I'll, uh, I'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate you having me on. Anytime. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Go. Now, it's time for me to pull chocks and take off. But before I go, I'm always looking for the memorable rescues that people have done. If you have one that you're willing to share or know somebody who has a story, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to highlight it here at The Real Rescue. For everybody that is standing by for that SAR alarm, remember, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. So until next time, fly safe and swim hard. Thank you for joining me today here at The Real Rescue Podcast, powered by Vertical Helicast. We'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors for this episode. The Axness PNG wireless ICS system can bring cutting edge wireless intercommunication system technology to any aircraft. The PNG system can be fully integrated into an existing ICS system or can be carried on and off as a mobile base station. They can go anywhere at any time on any aircraft. Plus with the strongest and most robust waterproof handheld on the market, this system can take a hit and keep working. Their wireless intercom systems are designed to enhance situational awareness through improved communication capability. This system brings superior noise canceling technology to eliminate rotor wash and engine noise from your ICS. The Axness PNG wireless system is currently deployed in more than 1800 public safety, 
air ambulance, and search and rescue aircrafts worldwide. If you want more information, contact them today at axnes.com. That's A-X-N-E-S.com. I see that you're editing and I just need to come over and just love on you because I want to distract you. I just need you to rub my back just for a minute. I know you're editing, but come rub my back because I'm cute. Like, just look at me, look at me. Do I look like a dog that needs to be loved? Yes, I do. So, love me, love me just a little bit longer and then you can go back to edit, that's all.